Lindsay Atwood, and the Steven Universe podcast is going to Homeworld. We're going to learn about Homeworld culture and its gem inhabitants from creator Rebecca Sugar and former executive producer Ian Jones Cordy. We'll discover what inspired the various gem classes and how their roles and functions not only work with each other, but within the gem's identities. Co-executive producer Joe Johnston and storyboard supervisor Hilary Florido return to give us a little bit of insight on Homeworld's development. And Erica Luttrell, the voice of Pat Paracha, is also going to stop by to talk about the lovable character with her amazing ability to predict the future after it already happens. So let's start today with Rebecca Sugar and Ian JQ. Thank you guys so much for coming and joining me. Hey, thank yeah. you. Yeah, no problem. So so today we're talking about Homeworld gems. So can you just tell us, like, I guess, early development and, like, as you slowly paced out looking at each of these new gems from Homeworld, what you had in mind in terms of, like, their their society? Hmm. Well, I'll say what I can, because I feel like there's a lot to still yeah, learn there's about a lot. them. There's a lot, yeah, we, there's yeah, a lot sure. we don't know. But the the thing that was always going to be true about Homeworld society is that it is all based on conformity and... There's a, there's a huge stress on appearances. Everyone has a very specific role, and their role is their function, and their function is who they are. The mm-hmm. way they look is what they do, is who they are. Like, there is no room for individuality on Homeworld at all. Uh, so mm-hmm. that has informed sort of um, or just the little, the little peaks that we've seen at it, I think, yeah, that's, you know, and and also the way Peridot talks about it, you know, everybody has, you know, people aren't, they're not individuals. You are your gem type and you are what you're for. There's a, there's like a Carl Jung thing about persona. It talks about how dangerous it is to kind of become, to have your identity be your job <laughs> because somebody else can control whether or not you're successful at being yourself. Anyway, that's Homeworld. Yeah, I remember being confused when we first learned that there are a bunch of different kinds of each gem. Like, there's a bunch of different pearls or whatever, and there's a bunch of different amethysts and all that. And I was like, how are they going to, like, differentiate? You know, how do they keep track of everyone? And, I mean, you have your designation, but really you are, like you said, you are your role. So, like, it's not really relevant. Yeah, it's not supposed You're, to be. You as an individual. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That uh, episode, Back to the Barn, was one that I always think about when I think of Homeworld. Mm-hmm. Even though it's like mm-hmm. so far removed, just because that's when we learned that pearls are like supposed to be that that servant class. That was like the first episode I watched live, and I was so struck by that. Like, when did you guys decide on like pearls' role and like the the whole structure? Oh, that was really early on. Oh my gosh, I have some ancient drawings of that interaction. There, I think they're yeah. so old that I wasn't even drawing. Mm-hmm. I, I think Peridot was still a. She still had actual... She didn't have limit hands. <laughs> That's how old those drawings are, like yeah. early Peridot drawings of her confronting Pearl about they're... being uh, yeah, and exceptionally I... mm-hmm. fancy. And I remember like a lot having a lot of early ideas about what exactly the gems were, like what their functions were in right. gem society. And that really played into that episode. Yeah. Um, and it was sort of something we had been building up in the characters' personalities. Uh, yeah, up to it, that point. It's such a shame mm-hmm. because, well, I think that's that's so rough because Pearl got to live, you know, in in Stephen's eyes for so long without him knowing that at all. Yeah. And all of a sudden it's just like going to be a part of how he sees her. I think it's something, I mean, Garnet is like that too, where there's a lot of weight in Garnet's mind of what it means for her to be a fusion that she doesn't necessarily want Stephen to have until she thinks he's old enough to handle it, but yeah. he's not from Homeworld, so he doesn't really uh-huh. have a lot of the know what a lot of that weight is. Yeah, exactly. He doesn't have the hangups that they have. Yeah, but is, they can't. Uh, that's mm-hmm. not they can't, easy for they, them to get exactly because they've been living in it for thousands of years. So, yeah, and for, yeah. I think you know, for Pearl to know that Stephen knows that, even if he doesn't know what that means, it's like it really changes everything. Yeah, I think she really enjoyed. I don't think, I don't think, I know, because <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I write for the show. Because yeah. um, you, you know, made it, you know. <laughs> she really, you know, and I think Garnet too. Garnet enjoyed that Stephen just thought of her as her own person. Yeah, you know? there was a lot of simplicity for them. And I think Stephen almost, you know, I think they began to understand that it was a way of sort of starting over. Mm-hmm. But there's also, a, I think, the thing that's nice about when the show goes on is that 
as much as those truths make them feel really vulnerable, even if Stephen doesn't have that, that understanding of it, they're able to be closer to him because he can understand a little better. He can understand why, why they're worried in a way that he couldn't before. And, and they, they're able to talk about it with someone who they know is just interested in how they feel yeah. about it. And that becomes, that becomes really new. I, yeah, that, I think the thing that really is harsh about having that happen in Back to the Barn is that Pearl doesn't get to do that herself. It just, yeah, it's it that, kind of happens for but her. Pa- she's like outed. Yeah, yeah Peridot sad. is so... Um, very rude. She's very rude, but she doesn't... She cannot <laughs> imagine a situation where someone wouldn't understand that just by looking at Pearl. Right. Um, but she's completely... She has no concept of how they have been living and there are things that just make sense to Peridot that she thinks makes sense to everyone because she hasn't she hasn't yet at that point figured out that (laughs) different people have different experiences that's something she has to figure out like over the course of her Mm -hmm. arc yeah and that home world mindset Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. i think too she like the fact that she thinks that pearl can't fight also is really frustrating because it's sort of like i don't know pearl's been fighting for so Long. Well, it's, this is also something mm-hmm. I think is interesting about Peridot and Bismuth, where they're kind of similar, which is that Bismuth will rib all of them about that stuff. It kind of like takes the tension out because like Bismuth is very shoulder punchy about all of their things that they're supposed to be because they're all so proud that they're not like that. Whereas Peridot is just like very matter of fact about it. Yep. It's, it's <laughs> She's very much like, this is just the way it is. Yeah. 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 She's just annoyed that you're out of line. There's a lot of the other gems from homeworld that it was really cool seeing like their their functions i think that one of them that i really liked to see was the zircons mm-hmm. and there was so much fan art after that episode it was fun. <laughs> um <laughs> just like just they're just they're i don't know something about they're just their designs are so fun but what do you think that like they how do you feel they would fall in terms of rank i mean they're pretty mid i think yeah yeah uh, and also they um you know they're one of the j- types of gem that uh, has a very specific function. So they mm-hmm. sort of will end up in this space where they are servant gems to a very upper class of gem. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, there's it's really interesting in that way. You know, they wouldn't be... They're technically not, like, a grunt, like a soldier or something like that. But they're not, yeah. like... but they don't have any real power. They don't have power, yeah. Uh, like at the end of the day especially i mean their court system is yeah like, not <laughs> very flawed. very kangaroo yeah. yeah i uh think it was really fun seeing the um at the human zoo the holly blue was a really fun reveal on the famethyst do you want to talk any about that oh yeah i mean holly holly blue is interesting because she's a quartz mm-hmm. but she i think she feels like because she's actually one of blue diamond's quartzes that she has so much more clout there with blue diamond running the place than these sort of adopted pink quartzes that she's Mm -hmm. managing um and she gives them a lot of guff for being from earth because that's what she has over them she's she's not and but at the at the end of the day they're they're all the same type yeah and so it's like and holly also is like she's got the sort of frustration of Someone with a thankless assignment. Yes, that too. You know, and mm. and she takes that all off on the famethyst, basically. Yeah, she's not she's not good. She's not a good person. <laughs> 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 um, but she's funny. Christy Petty is so good. Yeah, she, <laughs> she was hilarious. She was really based off of the. Uh, there's this woman in Funny Face who sings this song called Think Pink. It's sort of spoken. She says she wants everything to be pink. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I think she was a uh, oh the the actor who played that person was like a speech like would help actors with that specific kind of speech. What is it? Is it called Trans- uh, like, transatlantic? I don't know. Was it? This is this is very spe- anyway. Whatever. <laughs> Christine Petty is masterful at doing this uh, very specific kind of voice. I just love it. Yeah. The voice was great. It was very striking in that episode. I feel like another homeworld gem that we've met. Uh, is the rubies. And I think that it was uh, interesting seeing, like, you know, you have to balance the the comedic side of meeting homeworld gems where it's, like, the rubies and you're like, oh, they're incompetent. Like, <laughs> but, like, at the same time, they they remain a threat, like, homeworld at large. Mm-hmm. How do you, like, maintain that balance? 
Oh gosh, I guess that's I guess that's tricky. I mean, they. I think the thing about about like when Homeworld is sending out the rubies is that they can't really factor in the concept that the crystal gems will be the way they are when these people show up. Right. They don't like, they don't expect that they're going to have to go up against an intelligent adversary. Really. Yeah. Or or mm. cre- they don't gems don't understand creativity. Yeah. They don't understand it at all. Yeah. Like the idea they never prepped the rubies to go play baseball <laughs> with <laughs> yeah. with a bunch of gems. They wouldn't know how to how to prepare for that. Right. I think, you know, they expect that, you know, when people understand that Homeworld is after them, that everything will work the way it's supposed to work because everything's yeah. s- everyone is supposed to be how they're supposed to be and work how they're supposed to work and they kind of don't don't plan for an outcome that involved anyone yeah. being creative in any way. I also uh, wager that like a lot of the life forms that the gems have dealt with up until this point have been just just a lot easier to to like you know corral and you know do whatever they want to. Um, like the bird blob. Yeah, exactly. Like, from you know, jungle. <laughs> I feel like when it comes to humans and also other gems, it's like they can be outmaneuvered um, in ways that they're not expecting. Yeah, that they're not expecting. Mm-hmm. I think, too, they, you know, with the rubies, the, the whole strength of the whole thing that home, that makes rubies valuable to them is that they can combine. Yeah. Uh, you know, they. I think they're not expecting... Uh, a single ruby to solve any given problem no, or no. even a team of single rupees like when when they face whatever they're going to face they're going to turn into one huge adversary that mm-hmm. that will take care of the situation that's why you don't ruby ruby and sapphire being together is extremely unusual because you'd never send only one ruby to do anything yep that's just not a thing they're always in teams it's really unusual for ruby to be by herself I don't know if we've been super explicit about that, but there's a homeworld fact. (laughs) (laughs) Rubies rubies are always in teams. They travel in groups. I think we might mention it in the answer book briefly. Yeah, I think so. That they, yeah, that they are always in squads Mm and groups. Yeah. And they're not, the fact that they have different personalities, I mean, they're not supposed to. So that's sort of like something that's flying under the radar. Yeah. Mm. Homeworld-wise. Like nobody, people don't know. I don't think you know they're ne- they're never gonna be that cute in front of the time. <laughs> you know they, right. they wouldn't. Show yeah, they would be on their best behavior. <laughs> yeah, but they when do. they're alone, they're yeah. you yeah. know they can't help yeah. but be a little. Uh, you know, uh, the Ruby Squad is so fun. I love them. <laughs> yeah, I love them. <laughs> so like you talked about Ruby and Sapphire, and uh, just sort of that like how Garnet is sort of, I guess you know like an anomaly to Homeworld because Ruby, you know, first of all Ruby being alone, and then second of all meeting with sapphire and like the concept of them being a fusion together can you talk about that sort of like the taboo there yeah so the thing is you know if you're a gem you are a certain type of gem that gem is a certain is a certain color it looks a certain way it has a certain cut that's your name it's who you are um you know if you have five rubies and they all combine they become one huge ruby they're still a ruby Mm. um if you have two topazes they combine they right. become a big topaz. They're still a topaz. topaz. Yeah. Everyone understands what a topaz is. When there's one, that's a topaz. When there's two, there's a topaz fusion. When ruby and sapphire combine, that is new. They mm-hmm. change color. They're not red or blue. They're they're purple. They have two different types of gems, and now they've become a new person that isn't either of those gems. Yeah. And Homeworld mm-hmm. is not okay with that because they don't know what that is. Mm-hmm. When Homeworld gems saw a ruby and a sapphire combined they didn't they wouldn't say that there's now a garnet standing in front of us they wouldn't know what what that gem is they know Mm -hmm. what garnets are they've seen garnets and if two garnets combined they'd make a garnet yeah they don't understand that that a ruby and a sapphire could make garnet that's a decision that garnet Garnet made made. for herself yeah Yeah. that that's what she became yeah that's that's the name that she arrived at Mm-hmm. When two gems of two different colors and two different types combine, Homeworld doesn't know what that is, and they are not comfortable with that. They want to know who everyone is by looking at them and what their gem type is, what their job is. There's no, there are no gray areas like that for Homeworld. Mm-hmm. Rhodonite, mm-hmm. fluorite, I mean, that, you know, those are gems that... Oh, uh, well, we're getting into the off-colors. Off, yeah. yeah, off-colors. And that's the, <laughs> that is why they're called off-colors, because they're not... Fusions are 
pretty much automatically off colors if they're fusions of two different kinds of gems because they're not the color that those two gems were when they started. Yeah. That's the thing about them. It's it, it, you could have a gem that's a defect and they're, and they're off. They're, they came out off color because their coloration was slightly wrong or because their type is slightly mm-hmm. wrong. But if you're a fusion of two different types of gems, you're immediately going to be off color because your color changed. Yeah. It's just like totally. Mm-hmm. That's why it's so taboo. So so fusion is not mm-hmm. taboo as long as you become the same person. Yeah. Being off color right. is taboo. Being off color is taboo, and fusing with it, someone else who's different from you, you will become something different than yeah. the gender. And the off colors, the off colors were a um, were a group that I really wanted to be in the show. Yeah, yeah, that's Ian was championing that. Yeah, really hard, especially when you were leaving mm. to do OKKO. OK yeah, I was like, okay, I promise I'll find a way to do this. <laughs> um, mostly because um, in any like large society or system, you know, like homeworld, there's always going to be people who are statistically improbable. I think that's true in the real world too. It's like people think about you know people who their existence is improbable and they're on the edge. And the system basically has no place for them. And a lot of people's solution to that is be like, well, they deserve no support. They should just be thrown away in the trash. And basically, I wanted to know who those people were in homeworld society, what they were like, especially because if gems on Earth had discovered fusion, if there had been gems on Earth who had defects or were different, it's like, well, that must have gone on on Homeworld, and they must live a a very difficult existence in, in a society that's mm-hmm. not made for them. So that was one of the big uh, that was one of the big reasons why we we really wanted to have the off colors in the show. Um, yeah. I'm glad you did. I like it was fun to meet them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right, guys. Thank you so much for coming on and talking to me. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. All right. Steven Universe co-executive producer Joe Johnson and storyboard supervisor Hillary Florido are going to share their thoughts about Homeworld coming up. All right. I am here with Hillary Florido and Joe Johnston, who are a storyboard supervisor and a co-executive producer, respectively. Right, guys? Yes. Uh, thank you guys so much for coming back. We are back. Ain't no thing. Here we are. <laughs> we never left. Okay, so, yeah. <laughs> That's one of my favorite moments from, I think Lamar said that. Oh, he did? And, yeah, after we did an interview, he started with that. It was uh, really foreboding, actually, when you listen back. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like they're just always always there. You yeah, know? he's here in the room with us. Hey, Lamar, how you doing? <laughs> <laughs> he never leaves. So, today we're going to talk about Homeworld. So, um... The first thing I thought about was like, you know, especially early in the show when we were boarding or I mean, not me, but like when you guys were doing episodes like Back to the Barn, Sworn to the Sword, Marble Madness. There's a bunch of those that sort of drop these like little like hints and glimpses of like, oh, you know, this is what Homeworld is like. And people were piecing them together. But Stephen didn't know. So what was it like sort of dropping those little tidbits in? It was fun. (laughs) Yeah. It was really a really fun thing to do. We were talking about Homeworld very, very early in the show. Hillary, I can't remember. Were you there for the first like writers meeting that we had? They talked about Homeworld. Yeah, it was. It was right after we finished Ocean Gem, and we were just starting to talk about hey. like what was happening. Was that One B? That was the start of One B, I, I guess. I started One B. Yeah. I feel like I probably was. Yeah, we had a day where we were <laughs> we were talking about sort of the direction of what we wanted to do going forward it was right after we got it was right after we got in the 1b pickup okay yeah so maybe we weren't even done with ocean gem at that point this was five years ago so who who knows but yeah back back then back then we were already laying the groundwork for a sort of go to homeworld somewhere in space heist arc which is what um the zoo arc became the early ideas were about greg getting uh, kidnapped and taken to Homeworld, or or Steven, respectively, some something like that. I remember really pushing for like, let's go to Homeworld at the end of season one. And, <laughs> um, that would have been way too early. So it it turned into the the plan that we ended up doing, which was sort of seeding things just very very slowly um, in the show and just building it up and up and up and up, which was what we were already doing on the show with Steven's powers and uh, who the gems were. Mm-hmm. All of the first twenty six episodes are all about who the gems are and where they're from 
And we just do that very slowly. They have these powers. They, when they poof, they turn back into gems. The, the gems are these things. They're the actual core of their being. The monsters are also gems. It was all about like mm. laying all that groundwork. And then when we got to there, it was like, okay, now where do gems come from? What is their society and their culture like? Um, I felt like the culture was always seated because it was a part of the characters themselves mm -hmm. and how you mm -hmm. know, the structure they had to break out of to become themselves. Yeah, I do like that we, I feel like every episode, there's a little nugget. Mm -hmm. there, yeah, we always tried. There is no true filler episode. Because <laughs> <laughs> there's always a nugget. Yeah. Maybe it's at the last second of the episode. Yeah. But yeah, yeah it's we put it there. always been a really slow burn. Because then it gets really satisfying when you put the pieces together mm -hmm. or if you predict them and you're right. Yeah, and we always wanted the audience to be able to, like, put those pieces together themselves. We're never trying to, like... We got gotcha. you. We're never trying to like really <laughs> yeah. fool the audience into th thinking one thing. Well, maybe we are sometimes, but for the most part, but, we're like. I think it's it's always in the service of the point of view of Stephen. Yeah. Like if because you're watching everything through Stephen, so if Stephen believes one thing, you're inclined to believe that, and then once he finds out new information, like you're finding out it out as well. Yeah. Like mm -hmm. same time. So. Mm -hmm. So nothing just comes like out of left field or anything. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a good way to do it. You talked about uh, dropping those little nuggets in. When you're um, boarding scenes with, like, gem or homeworld structures or technology or whatever, like, in uh, it could have been great. There's that staircase that raises up or the giant hands in Marble Madness with Peridot. Um, so, like, what was it, like, how do you guys approach, how much freedom do you have when you have to board scenes with that kind of technology? Like, are there, like, guidelines for... Homeworld does this, but they don't do this, or, or were you kind of just making it up and then and then sort of basing it off of that? Back then, we were just making it up on the fly, and mm -hmm. since we're a board-driven show, and the board artists are always encouraged to just invent um, whatever they want to invent to tell the story that they, well, the part of the story that they want to tell. So, so things like the staircase were just like, that's just cool. Let's just find like cool <laughs> space-floating things to do. But I, then, uh, I remember other... that being pitched that went over really well. Cool. <laughs> and then there's other things like the the upside down pyramid in Sirius Steven, the especially the mural that's inside that pyramid and what that pyramid yes. is were all sort of done before we sort of had a a firm understanding of what the the lore of the show is. Mm -hmm in terms of like what these structures are and what they're for and what they do. So there was a version of that mural that was completely different um, that I did. And then that Rebecca ended up revising as like, because, because the, the core like big story of the show was really being invented right around then. And so we had to go back in and sort of adjust. <laughs> and not reveal it all yeah. in a mural. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like we said, nuggets. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, just nuggets. You can't like just paint it all <laughs> on the ceiling for the, uh, anybody to look at. That mural had so many theories. Yes. It's crazy. Yes. People were pouring over every little detail. I love that, though. It's, it's, yeah. It makes we'll it able, more satisfying. We'll be able to talk about that at yeah, a different yeah. time. We can talk One about day. the One full uh, and it'll story be really of that mural. it exciting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> when that day comes. <laughs> but then, like... The other part of this is there was a, an effort uh, to differentiate the sort of timeline for Homeworld through the, like, the architecture. Um, so all of the structures that you see on Earth are from Era 1, and they're all very classical and Art Deco with you know, these Roman column-looking things. Mm -hmm. um, and then as we slowly introduced Homeworld, it's a much different architecture because the society has had thousands of years uh, to decide to build their buildings a different way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Frank Lloyd Wright has been dead for like a really long time. Yeah. <laughs> it's just fact. We got to adapt. Mm -hmm. Got to evolve. I love it. Then you go to like the newer episodes, like the trial and off colors that mm -hmm. are like, so like what era would that be? Homeworld lives in, currently they live in era two. Oh, okay. Era one was all of homeworld before the war and their colonization and then since the war and since stuff happened stuff happened mm -hmm. they've been they've moved on to era two which has become much more rigid much more controlled it's pretty mm. sleek yep 
And that's that, that, post, that postmodern look that we've... Aesthetic. Aesthetic, yes. <laughs> What's it like when you guys uh, get to finally board out what, your, uh, what Homeworld looks like in the episodes, uh, The Trial and Off Colors, for viewers? What were your thoughts then? I feel like at the time, it was like, is this right? Are we doing it right? <laughs> <laughs> is, this how, is this how we want it to be? This, this makes sense. Yeah, okay. It was always something that always felt really far in the future that we were going to do. And then mm. suddenly it was happening. It was the future. It was. Yeah. We're in it. Here we are in the future. And <laughs> it was, yeah, it was, it was always just very, very, we, we didn't know how to feel. <laughs> we still don't know how to feel. Like it's right. Like we, we, well, the other thing is like we, we do these episodes and then it'll be a while before the air. And so when they do finally air, it's like, oh yeah, wait, they haven't, people haven't seen that yet. Oh yeah. yeah. We, we did that a while ago. We've already moved on to other things. <laughs> That's kind of like for all of the big moments in the show, that's kind of always how they felt. It's like, oh, oh wow, we're here. Mm-hmm. But then it, it takes a while for till the audience gets to see it. And by then we're, yeah, we've moved on. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> we're seeing some other episode new now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Seeing, yeah, yeah. Seeing someone new. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's over. It's like two different, it's, it's crazy thinking about how you have to keep track of all of the stuff, like so many different timelines and points of view mm-hmm. in terms of thinking. Well, just, just one point of view, so. Right, right, right. <laughs> I mean, the, I mean more like in terms of like the point of view of the viewer versus like oh, you yeah. guys having yeah, yeah, seen yeah, everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 yeah some, it's, sometimes it is hard to keep track of like, wait, do they, they know this, right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yes. We said this in that episode. <laughs> and so they know this. And so we can say this. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because that's what I'm thinking is like, because like we talked about, you know, you sort of drop these little tidbits in all these episodes. And so in order to like remember everything that's been shown, it's like, well, I guess I'll just rewatch all of the Steven Universe to make this next episode, you know, like, uh, (laughs) and like, obviously you can't do that every single time. So is it like tough keeping track? Yeah, I don't do it. (laughs) (laughs) I I don't know if I'm notorious, but I I consistently ask, is that an episode I did? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> did we do this <laughs> i'm consistently mixing up names of shows like i i can't remember episode names sometimes but you know what happens in episodes yes yes right. you, you always end up like is it's that one episode with amethyst and she does the thing oh yeah yeah, yeah that that episode yeah. mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and i'm the one who's like oh yeah yeah, yeah. okay that episode <laughs> <laughs> i mean to be fair it's a lot like yeah, there's it is we, a lot we, you yeah. know and it's been going on for so long too yeah. And and I have to like remember my social security too. I'm like Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> like, Priorities, what? Man. <laughs> how are they how are they expecting me to do all of this? How did you guys approach with the then the zoo arc? Like we, we touched on that a little bit, but it introduced a lot more characters and stuff too, like the Thamethyst and Holly Blue. Yeah. What's been really nice is when we've when we've brought in Homeworld gems, um, they've been our vehicle for really introducing Homeworld, uh, because our, the main mm-hmm. gems don't really want to talk about Homeworld. They don't really associate themselves with Homeworld. Um, so when we get characters like Peridot or Holly Blue in, they become our vehicle for uh, just just dumping exposition um, <laughs> on h- how things are you know done on Homeworld. And I guess with Holly, that was really the first time. Well, not really the first time, but a- another opportunity to show sort of the hierarchy of gems Mm -hmm. and gem culture and also really the first time showing individual gems interacting with the diamonds um and how they treat the diamonds and how they revere them and there's a little there's 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 a lot of that in in peridot with peridot's arc in uh back to the barn and it could have been great but yeah holly blue was another and the zoo arc was another opportunity to just reinforce that and and show that off more yeah it's always more effective to I mean, you joke about dumping exposition, but we're <laughs> to show rather than tell. Like, yes. if, if you mm-hmm. just heard Pearl dropping facts in the kitchen, you'd be like, all right, yeah, okay, this doesn't have any gravity. But when mm. you're interacting with a new gem who's a threat, who's moving and acting in ways that, like, you're unfamiliar with, you have to fill in the gaps and context clues. Yeah, yeah, and that's right. the thing that's, that's ha- the reason that, that works in back to the barn is because even though we are just talking about concepts like pearl is one of many gems and the concept of gems 
having multiple types and also like there's many of the same type like those yeah. were new like very big concepts to just suddenly drop but we have peridot there who is acting like a gem who is above a pearl and trying to give orders and expecting pearl to act a certain way so we have that to sort of reinforce i guess the the theme and and the plot and the facts basically of of <laughs> Of what gem society is i remember i'd forgotten that that back to the barn was the episode where they they talked about having multiple pearls that was crazy that was the first episode i saw live and i remember vividly like in my dorm room being like what <laughs> what <laughs> <laughs> there's more but it was a good moment <laughs> yeah and then we uh then we have a robot battle yeah <laughs> yeah exactly the whole that it's just, it's the whole package it's got it all that's what i like Okay, cool. Thank you guys so much for coming on and talking to me. Yeah. No sweat. Yeah. And coming up, we have Erica Luttrell, the voice of fan favorite Pad Paracha. All right, I am here with Erica Luttrell, and uh, yeah, thank you so much for coming. It is so my pleasure. (laughs) So uh, what is it like playing the role of the off-color gym Pad Paracha? Uh, it's hilarious. Yeah. First off, I find it like challenging not to laugh at my own dialogue sometimes <laughs> because we'll be shooting it sometimes with with the other actors. Sometimes it's just you, but typically it's you and at least one or two other people, and sometimes it's the whole cast, depending. And so all of that stuff has already happened. Also for us in the recording booth, we'll see all the all the storyboards, and we'll have recorded all of the things that have happened. And then Pat Rash will be like, "I predict that Lars." <laughs> well, I'm like, "But we just—it's so funny," and they're all laughing, and I can't, you know, <laughs> it can be challenging in that regard. But it's fun. I mean, she's adorable. I love how accepting everybody around her is of her uniqueness. <laughs> you know, they're just like, "Ah, oh, you know, that's that's she's, just she's, it's fine." She's doing her best. Yeah. She's doing her best. It's very like, sweet. You're doing amazing. Mm-hmm. You're doing amazing and never never change. Never <laughs> change who you are, sweetheart. Just yes. never. That's right. Exactly. Yeah. Because would you would you find it more difficult to do you or do you find it more difficult to play Pad Paracha than Sapphire because of the whole laughing thing? Yeah. Yeah. I guess yeah. To a certain to... extent it is more challenging. Also because there's like a comedic element to her and mm-hmm. there's like a comedic timing element to what she's doing. Right. So there's that. Uh, challenge too because you don't want to say it. although I suppose editors have some responsibility for yeah. where they place the line anyway so but I think yeah because there's more comedy in it there there it can be a little bit more challenging for me because I've done a lot more drama in my life mm. yeah so what was your reaction when you first found out that there was going to be like a second variation of sapphire i <laughs> i thought it was delightful i yeah. la- i laughed I, especially when i heard the the description of her i was like that's the best did they get i to love the show it <laughs> did so somebody good. get to pitch it to you or did they just send you like this no one? they were just like okay so you'll have you'll be recording in the next uh two three weeks on wednesday you'll come in there'll be another character pad paraja and i was like great and then i got in and they described her to me and then i you know <laughs> and you go from there right 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 yeah that's exciting it's like i think that that's something that's pretty unique about this show in that yeah. they they like it's built into it that all the characters of the same like type will have the same voice right. actor even though the voices themselves are different. Right, exactly. Um what did you think about learning about the whole like group of off colors? Oh. I love them. Same. I it's just <laughs> I, I know I just I find them so moving. I find it moving that they found each other and that they have purpose uh and so on. Yeah, all of them are each in their own way very and they and they it's just the love yeah. that I think I find the most uh impressive about their group and just who they are I, I just it, for me it's also just everything about the show for me is that you know it's like very much about love it's very much about sort of acceptance of everybody because everybody's different mm-hmm. you mm-hmm. know everybody's a little bit weird or off color yes. <laughs> you know if you dig deep enough you know and we all work pretty hard to hide it but Right, but it's there. <laughs> it's there. It's so. there. She can't really. She can't. She can't. And she never <laughs> needs to. It's yeah. good. Yeah. Being herself. Yeah. Yeah. I talked with uh, the writers, Matt and Ben, and they said it was a challenge to to balance making her like engaging without being like aggravating. You know, like because right. it's like if she repeated everything that ever happened, it would it would be like okay like, right <laughs> just the important <laughs> stuff you yeah, know exactly like, <laughs> Lars just dies and, and she's like 10 10 seconds later yeah. she's like wow something incredible <laughs> yeah. it's like you're doing great 
Is your approach different for both of them? Oh, 100 percent. Yeah. yeah. I mean, because yeah. It's comedic and dramatic, right? Comedic and dramatic. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Serious, not as serious. I mean, she's serious. She th- thinks. Yeah. <laughs> she thinks. Um, but she's also just sweeter. Yeah. She's just, you know, Sapphire knows. Mm-hmm. You know, she just knows. Whereas Pat Paratcha thinks she knows. <laughs> uh, and. And, and there's an innocence in that, her thinking she knows, whereas yeah. Sapphire knows that she knows, and there is a weight in her knowing yeah. that she knows. She's just so earnest, it feels like, you yeah. know? Like, with all of her predictions, she's like, it makes you just want to hug her. <laughs> Aww. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, guys. I know it's not me, but it is. <laughs> <laughs> so do you think, like, who who do you think could benefit the most from the whole off-color, like, the lessons that... You know, that acceptance. People who who in the world could benefit? Yeah. I mean, I think, honestly, everybody could. Because that's the thing. I mean, I feel like we all have that. Right. Every person, I, you know, I feel like when we sort of categorize people, there's so many ways and diagnoses and things that people can use to sort of decide somebody is a thing that they understand. But it's not, then that allows you to put them off in a box somewhere and all that sort of stuff. But then it also allows you to attack yourself more for the things that are different about you. Mm-hmm. Because, oh, I shouldn't, I, you know, I'm close enough to the norm that I can fit it. But you're, no one, is, there is no normal, mm-hmm. you know. So I feel like the more people are willing to accept the people that seem even more different than them, the easier they'll be able to live their own lives accepting of their own inner quirks and differences. It, it seems like it's really interesting looking at, Sapphire and Pad Paracha just because Sapphire is sort of, I don't know, like it's like a rep- it's like a reminder of like the rigid structure of the of homeworld and gem society and everything, right? Yeah, um, because she is like the aristocratic role, and then Pad Paracha is like the whole flip, the other flip side of that coin where they they're, they're yeah. just like living like exiled essentially from yeah. the, the whole place. What do you think about that? Well, I just think that there has to be a place for everybody in right. any society or group or community. And there is a place for everybody. It's just we decide that there are only so many places, mm-hmm. you know, and that there isn't a use for these other forms of perception mm-hmm. or beingness, you know. But there is if we actually are open to seeing it. There's always value. You know, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for talking to me. Oh, thank you. My pleasure. The Steven Universe podcast is produced by Stacey Para, Charles Abadji, and Conrad Montgomery. Special thanks to Rob Sorcher, Cartoon Network Studios, The Crewniverse, and Turner Studios in Atlanta. And coming up next Thursday, an episode on fusions. I've got AJ Mashaka coming in to talk about Stevani. Rebecca Sugar and Ian JQ are going to return and give us some insight on the conception and development of fusions. And Steven Universe comic writer Grace Craft is going to join us to share her discovery of the show, her journey to making comics, and why she loves Opal. So subscribe to the Steven Universe podcast now at Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to podcasts so you don't miss out on this upcoming special episode. And please leave us a five-star rating interview while you're there. I'm Mackenzie Atwood, and I will see you next Thursday. 